From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. We'd like to thank Microsoft this week for sponsoring this episode of Fragmented. Microsoft's here to promote App Center, which is a continuous integration, delivery, and feedback suite of cloud services for Android applications. So hopefully that kind of rings a bell. With App Center, you can automate your Android applications development lifecycle in regards to building, testing, distributing, monitoring, and push notifications, et cetera, et cetera, which kind of helps you ship all those high quality five-star apps. As we know, building a development pipeline is kind of a big pain, but App Center aims to make that a lot easier, and you can get started in a few minutes. You can just connect your GitHub or Bitbucket repositories right there in the cloud, and you can immediately start building and testing on thousands of real Android devices. You can also distribute your apps to beta testers on Google Play and monitor real-world usage and crashes with an analytics data with their built-in tools as well. The cool thing about App Center is you're not required to use every single one of their tools. You can pick and choose the things that you would like to use and just use those if you'd like to and start connecting it to the existing tools that you may already use. Now, if you're interested, you can sign up at appcenter.ms, get going and get your apps building and spend less time configuring servers and worrying about development pipelines and more time coding and solving real world problems. Kashik, how you been? I have been good. I hear it's a little cold there uh, in New Jersey. Are you holding up okay? It is. We're in the middle of a blizzard right now, so hopefully everything hangs in there and I don't get disconnected from the recording today. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's a little chilly, but that's what happens when you live in the Northeast. How's it going <laughs> over there in, uh, in San Francisco land? No blizzard here. Just a little rain. So as long as I you know take my raincoat, I think I'm usually okay here. So uh, the weather has been treating us much better in the last few days. So what are we going to chat about today? Ooh, we should get going. We have a very interesting topic. This is a topic that has been requested multiple times. It's a topic that you and I have been interested in, that we've been sort of mildly dabbling into. It's a topic we have a good friend of the show who seems to know a thing or two about this. So uh, we are going to kick it off with that. So can you tell us what this topic is going to be, Don? The topic is that we're going to be talking about today is Flutter and platform code sharing. And so we have brought Eugenio Marletti onto the show. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. For folks that aren't familiar with with you, your background, we know of you, of course, from the community and also being a a fellow GDE. But for the folks who aren't familiar with you, could you give a little bit of a background about uh, who you are, uh, what you do, kind of the maybe where you work and so forth in regards to Android development? So I'm originally from Italy, uh, from Turin, where uh, the Joycon Italy is generally hosted. Um, I was doing some freelance job until essentially I fell in love with Android, but it was hard to get uh, a nice full-time job there. So I eventually moved to Berlin and started working at Clue, which is a um, female health tracking app. Uh, a startup here in Berlin. And since then, I've been the lead Android engineer. And during this progress, I became interested in various topics like Kotlin, like Flutter, like Rx Java. Um, and that's what led me to spread more and more uh, towards public speaking, doing community work, etc. So I guess the thing that we want to really talk about today is Flutter, right? There's been some recent yeah. uh, developments with Flutter. And basically what we thought is we'd talk to you about what Flutter is, what it's written in, and give us the rundown on what Flutter is, right? Like, should I care about Flutter today? So that's basically how we want to kick this conversation off. Okay, so Flutter was born out of an internal need that Google had, where they wanted to develop mobile applications, um, especially applications that were shared across different platforms like Android and iOS. And they found out that the existing tools were not great. Um, and so this one experiment that, that was born uh, from a small group of people that had a crazy idea, um, which was to take Chrome and remove all the HTML and CSS bullshit that was <laughs> slowing it down and see what would happen there. And they actually created the very first, let's say, core of Flutter. Um, they knew that you know, they were onto something. And so they kept developing that and eventually it just became Flutter. Wow. 
Wow, I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Which is also why it, it makes it more, how can I say, uh, trustworthy? Because it's not just you know a whim or an experiment. It's something that they actually use and they have been using for quite some time internally. So And even on, on really big uh, apps. So when you say uh, this is something that they've been using internally, you mean like the Flutter framework per se? Or is it the... Uh, the Chrome engine per se that they have sort of uh, removed like all the uh, yeah the non-essential parts. No, the the flutter, flutter itself. Oh wow, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What apps have they have they used it on? <laughs> so it's hard to make them say exactly. Of course. And the point <laughs> is that because Flutter is what it is, it's hard to tell because they look exactly the same. But there's something about uh, managing uh, ads that it is entirely written in Flutter, for example. And it's funny because like they the way they described it is that. One, so they also use it internally, right? And then one day they wanted to create the iOS client for it. So instead of doing that, they just rewrote the entire app from Android in Flutter and shipped it to both platforms. And the existing Android users, they didn't see the difference. Like they didn't even realize that the app had been rewritten in Flutter. That is something that, I mean, yeah, that's, that's impressive. Pretty, yeah, that's pretty impressive. So Flutter, it it's came from, I mean, Chrome, but... If I remember correctly, if I'm going to write, I mean, from my recent looks at Flutter, and I have really no experience in it other than just diving into the documentation a few times, is that if I'm going to write a, a Flutter app, it's, it's cross-platform, so I can compile both to iOS and Android. Do I get to write in Java or Kotlin, or what, do I, what language do I have to write this in? Or JavaScript. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, JavaScript, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the very first thing you should know about Flutter is that it's different than anything else out there. Um, any, let's say, let's call it cross-platform framework out there does one thing because it's the only thing that they can do. Um, they use the existing platforms to draw stuff on the screen. And the logic is somehow implemented in a different way. Like for React Native, it's implemented uh, in JavaScript, running in a different thread. For Xamarin, is uh, still like uh, on on Android is interpreted, if I'm not mistaken, and on iOS is compiled. But that's just the logic part. It still reuses the existing um, widgets, so the Android framework and whatever is there on iOS. And Flutter is different because they actually created the equivalent of a game engine, but for apps. So Flutter doesn't use anything of the existing widgets. It writes, uh, draws the story directly on the screen. And that's why it's cross-platform by definition. But the, the cross-platformness is just a side effect. So this is really interesting. This is, uh, I, I want to sort of dwell on this point a little more because I think this is fascinating. Even today, uh, if lo listeners don't know, a lot of games that are used don't use typical list views or like UI stuff. Like everything is oh, yeah, no, either yeah. like OpenGL, Unity or whatever the mm -hmm. game platform engines are. If you use, if you play a game today and I imagine many people play games on their phones today. So all of that is done using a similar game engine. So what you're saying the folks at Google did with Flutter is they try to approach, approach it with that idea in mind, right? Yeah, because again, like this core of having Chrome without all the stuff on top of it, um, which, if I'm not mistaken, was mostly C++, that could run anywhere, and it was able to draw directly on the screen. And they just kept that and kept working on it and developed it into the, the framework that you see today. Because like, if the, the day that I lost hope in Android was the day when I realized that the um, layout method in the view framework is final. So you can never, ever override that in, at least in you know, previous versions of Android. Uh, it's still final, but it might change in the future. What method was that? Uh, layout. Oh, layout, okay. So that that's it, that's a limit. Like you can never ever change that. And so you'll never be able to, um, let's say tweak the view framework to to do really whatever you want, right? Unless you're crazy enough to, to rewrite the entire view framework, which no one would ever do, right? And they did, so. So that brings up a good question is you've, We've re-implemented, well, not re-implemented, but now we have this game engine style of framework to work with. But what, as a developer who wants to build an app for a company who wants it to be cross-platform, they want an Android app, they want an iOS app, but I need buttons, I need input text, I need text views. Where do I get that? Do I have to write that myself? So, no, is a short answer. Thank God. <laughs> they, no, they were really smart. So um, customization was... 
a core principle since the very beginning. And so they structured the entire system to make sure that it was A, based on layers, so that at any point in time, you could either jump to a lower layer and go much deeper, essentially, or everything else that was you know, uh, built on top of these layers uh, had to be composable. So uh, the, using this approach, they rebuilt, I don't know, for example, the entire um, material widgets and the so-called Cupertino widgets, which are the iOS ones. Oh, is that okay. a real um, thing? <laughs> yeah, Cupertino, Cupertino widgets. <laughs> it is, it is, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so yeah, they, they, they just said, let's just make it pixel perfect and redraw the exact same things that are already there, but with this new system. And so what you get today is this foundation where you can at any point take what they created, disassemble it and reassemble it however you want, or recreate it from scratch if you want. The point is, it is entirely possible. Like there is nothing you cannot customize all the way down to the engine. Um, and although it sounds crazy, you can always, if you want, fork the entire project and change it in ways that are really insane. Um, keep in mind that with Flutter, every time you ship a Flutter app, you're shipping the entire framework. You're shipping the entire engine every single time. And so if there's like a bug fix or if you want to change something, you absolutely can. Does that make the application size huge? Yeah, I was, there was a follow-up question. Well, it depends what you need by huge, but like the hello world <laughs> with like just the framework and like, you know, a bullshit screen just, you know, saying nothing. It's something like seven or eight megabytes, which is not too bad. Um, Interesting. And okay. there is one thing to be said. Um, they had not yet optimized for size at all. Um, they just focus on getting the functionality there and the performance. Uh, they said there's a lot of uh, low-hanging fruits to get um, the size mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So I expect that to happen. And I think they told me they can get it down up to, I don't know, four, six megabytes or something. So yeah, definitely worth what you get. And it's actually quite impressive. That's pretty good. Cool. So I guess, and this might be diving into the specifics, but I had this question, so I'll bring it up anyway. Uh, the... So you're saying that they recreated a lot of the UI components uh, in this game engine style sort of rendering, right? Mm -hmm. What that would mean is that we would require them to sort of build these components every single time though, right? And I'm I'm not too worried necessarily, say, with Android because obviously Flutter is by Google. So there's uh, probably a higher sort of correlation between the internal teams. And so anytime a new component comes in or a new style, like uh, I'm thinking maybe, you know, bottom navigation bars or something, right? A new mm -hmm. material widget comes out. And uh, I mean, you know, in terms of like the design style guide, I'm, I don't have too much concern over Google re-implementing that for Flutter. But we should bring up the caveat that, like, say if it's a different framework, like with iOS, and a new framework comes in there, that's something that they would have to re-implement, right? This is not something that just comes out of the box, right? Sure, yeah. Okay. But if you did want to customize stuff, like, say I have uh, an example of, like, this button that I want that's fancy. So it's not like a material design. It's just something that my designer sat with me and said, hey, I want this specific fancy button to perform mm -hmm. in this certain way. How easy or difficult would that be with Flutter? So that's the whole point. It's very, very easy. Um, a few comments on what you say. First of all, this is the first time, the first framework where if you want to draw the exact same thing on all the platforms, that's actually the easy path because you just do it once and it just works everywhere. Uh, if you wanted to draw something different for each platform, that's actually extra work because you have to do... Twice, yeah. Uh, you still write in the same framework, but you write two different code paths, essentially, or at least tweak them a little bit. Uh, in fact, what you can do, and the demo does it very well, the, the gallery demo they have, you can draw iOS apps on Android and you can draw Android apps on iOS because in the end, it's just about drawing stuff on the screen. They, they created this set of uh, rules that, that um, you as a, as a user expect, like uh, the size of things, the physics of scrolling, of how things respond, ripples, etc. And they are customized per platform, uh, but the platform is just a constant somewhere that you can change at runtime. So, you know. I can finally write that iOS app, port it to Android like my clients want. Did anybody get nobody got that joke. All right, nobody got it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, dang it. So yeah, no. Um about um getting, you know, like 
a new design language or even just a new widget comes out and they have to create it from, from scratch, essentially. So two interesting facts. One is that, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but um, in the past, they would link directly as documentation to the material design spec for the material widget, um, which is crazy. And they actually have a better implementation of the material widgets that Andre has, which is also completely crazy. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th there are some widgets that they implemented that I don't think I, I never heard about before in my life with, I don't know, weird names that are not available on Android for sure. Can so you give us side. an example of yeah, some of these? <sighs> There's something called, if I'm not mistaken, a stepper. A stepper, interesting. Yeah, uh, which, I don't know, guess, what, what does it do? Uh, is is it like a wizard kind of thing that yeah, takes what, you yeah, through what? different steps? Uh, ish, it's something like, you know when Google Maps shows you the different pieces, like... Oh, uh, I know what you're you talking about now. For, for some time and oh, then you take the bus. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. Oh, wow, right? that's interesting. Yes, <laughs> super weird. And anyway, like things like that. So that's one, and apparently they were not just able to rebuild the entire material stuff, but it was actually easy, uh, mm -hmm. way easier than it would be on Android. Um, and that's more or less the whole point. Like when anything new comes out, one, it's so easy to re-implement it that it's not a problem. And if people start using it and they are, um, even the community can create anything from, from scratch uh, in, in very little time. And the second part is that not only they are committed to doing it, but Google is using it is internally, and Google doesn't just ship um, apps on Android. They do have iOS apps. It's a whole point of why this project uh, was developed, essentially. So, I mean, it's in their best interest to have this going. So, so now let's take this a step further. If I'm already interested in, in creating a Flutter app, what's the next step to actually getting started in writing a, a Flutter app? Is there... I already have the, you know, I already know JavaScript. So you said I could write JavaScript, right? No. Oh, okay. All right. So what do I have to, <laughs> what do I have to write this in and how do I get started writing an actual Flutter app? Yeah. Okay. So before I answer that, there's a, a little introduction I want to make. Uh, okay. Fun fact. Did you know that the very first version, actually versions of Flutter were written in JavaScript? Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. They, they hit. Uh, huge bottlenecks uh, for performance, and I'll tell you why more later. Um, this this reactive style they use, where you have these immutable tree structures that are diffed every time, they create a lot of objects, and that's super super painful to do in JavaScript because the garbage collection um, is not meant to be used that way. The other thing is that they did some internal uh, user testing of the Flutter APIs without telling people what language was written in. They just show them code and they said, try to change this, try to change that. And after like one day, they asked them, do you know what you're using? And they didn't know, but they were able to just pick it up and change it and use it as if it was a language they already knew. It's more like that it's very familiar. Like if you know Java or C Sharp or JavaScript or, you know, oh, more I or see. less okay. any mm -hmm. C style you know, language, common language, yeah. Um, you'll be able to pick it up like super easy. So that, that's the whole point. So that's one part. Yeah. And this language is Dart, which everybody thought was dead, but apparently it's not. Uh, <laughs> it's being used inside Google a lot. I think they introduced it independently as a language at some point, And then everyone was basically like, oh, whatever, Google, like, exactly. you know, get another language. <laughs> yeah, pretty uh, much. And I mean, I, I, yeah, I'll be honest. I thought the same thing too. Yep. Right? I was like, I mean, whatever. Like, this does not necessarily look as impressive to me. I don't see why you would write anything in Dart. Like, why would I sure. learn anything in Dart today? Sure, right? sure, sure. Uh, so, but Flutter is written entirely in Dart, uh, or rather, well, I, the, or rather, if I were to write a Flutter app, I would have to write it in Dart. That's correct. The only part in Flutter that is not written in Dart is the low-level uh, engine, which is C plus plus. Yeah, no. So I, I want to answer about the how do I create an app, uh, and then we can dig if you want into like why Dart and how does it work under the hood. Yeah, sure. I think that's super interesting. For example. Um, so Flutter comes with really, really cool support for tooling. So um, one, you can do everything you want on the command line, uh, and it works extremely well, uh, but you don't have to, uh, there's plugins for IntelliJ IDEA, Android Studio, which are the recommended IDEs, or you can also use uh, Visual Studio Code, which has an excellent oh. integration. Uh, fun fact, it's made by, I think a single person, uh, so it's from the community. 
Uh, it's not from Google, but it's just so good. And they are, if I'm not mistaken, collaborating lately because also a lot of Googlers prefer Visual Studio Code uh, over IntelliJ or Android Studio. So, oh, wow. is that just because it's so lightweight? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I've been using it a lot too. It's very lightweight. Yeah, so what you do is that, let's, let's take Android Studio, for example. Um, once you, okay, first of all, and this will sound crazy, but you clone the Flutter repository. So Git clone, etc. Uh, which at the beginning I thought was crazy. Uh, and, and it was just because it, it was like in early stages, but it turns out it's a brilliant system to do it because it's so easy to, to manage and update and modify if you want to, because I've been doing some modifications for fun and it's actually like you already have everything there. It's crazy. So you do that, clone the repo, uh, and then you run uh, a few commands. There's this uh, Flutter doctor, uh, which tells you exactly what you need to do next. And it's perfect um, because you need essentially the, the tool chain for compiling either Android or iOS or both. It's up to you. Uh, but at least one of them you need to have. Uh, once you have all that set up, you probably want to install the IntelliJ or Android Studio plugin for Flutter, which either automatically or you manually have to also install the Dart plugin for the, you know, the code uh, highlighting and stuff. And once you do that, you can create a new project and you can start hacking away. Uh, one thing that I suggest to do is to enable in the settings, um, there's like one experimental feature called uh, Outline View, which is super, super good. It allows you to, so you press one button in the IDE and that changes your UI in the sense that now whatever part of the screen you touch, it will tell you exactly what that is in code. So where that structure is, like, you know, like a tree structure, but also you can jump directly from there to the source code and it's just mind blowing. That's one part. What? I know. Interesting. The other part is that you can, oh, we haven't talked about this yet, but still you can hot reload when you save the file, which is insane so let's talk about that yeah that, this I is, guess interesting. is one of the biggest yeah this is and obviously one of the biggest right, right, uh, right i mean if the whole objective with flutter is to make developers more productive mm -hmm. one very big uh, feature is obviously the hot reload right yeah. and in you know like to cut short on what this feature means it's essentially what we Android developers think of as instant run, right? Exactly. Uh, but instant run, obviously, and I mean, everyone's complained about this. I complain about this like pretty publicly too. Uh, instant run usually doesn't always work as you want, uh, mm -hmm. as you want it to, especially in those few circumstances where it doesn't work. It's really annoying because you don't realize it's not working and then exactly. it throws you off and like your whole productivity is out of the window, right? Uh, so you're saying that Flutter has something equivalent, right? No, it's much, much better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, why is it better? And yeah, like, so why is it better? Okay, yeah. First of all, like it's not, it's not an afterthought. Like it, this is a core principle of the entire framework. Um, and it is made possible in many ways uh, by Dart. Because um, normally you have to choose like a language is either um, like interpreted on the fly or it's pre-compiled. Um, Dart is both, like you decide how to do it. So what happens is that when you are developing uh, applications, um, you ship to your device uh, a shell, which is like a web server, let's call it like that, that just listens for, for new code to, uh, to interpret on the fly. And that's why you can hot reload so fast, because you just send literally what changed um, and that gets executed immediately. Uh, while if you if you compile for production, it's actually pre-compiled ahead of time um, with all the performance uh, tuning you can imagine. So that's one part. The other part is they really really nailed it because so because of how the Flutter framework works, your state is declared separately from the actual UI or from the actual app. And so what that means is that every time you reload, even if you made substantial changes to the app, the state is preserved. So if you have a counter and every time you press a button, this counter goes up and then you completely change the UI around it, the counter still has the same value. I just want to step back a quick minute because you said some things that are interesting, yeah. right? You said it's both an interpreted language of sorts and it is a compiled time language, right? Like for our listeners, we should probably dive in and talk about what these are. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, most languages that us Android developers are used to using are compiled 
uh, languages, right? For example, Java, Kotlin, uh, everything like compiles down to like class files, which then a JVM or something else, a virtual machine runs. Mm-hmm. And that's like the whole compile time. So which means anytime I make a file change, this whole process has to be repeated. It has to be yeah. compiled down all the way to a class file or, you know, some kind of binary, which is then shipped, right? Uh, an interpreted language is a little different. And I guess Python is an example, the first one that comes to mind, at least for me. Uh, yeah, or JavaScript. Or JavaScript. The code that you write is sort of directly shipped and it's like on the fly, sort of like interpreted. Pretty much, yeah. Or, or compiled on the fly in a way. And so what you're saying is Dart is a little of both or is it no flutter the framework achieves the interpreted sort of no, aspect no, no. of it so uh, it's it's all of it uh dart started out as some sort of uh, javascript replacement like a, a better way to to do things you would do in javascript right and so it was aimed at the web hoping that uh in time browsers would have some sort of native engine for running uh, dart code uh, in an optimized way that didn't happen and so they sort of pivoted to doing more with it and the, the more part is that now you can do uh, three things with Dart. You can run it in a Dart interpreter. You can compile it to JavaScript and run it as JavaScript code. Or, and this specifically was created uh, especially for Flutter, you can compile it to ARM code. So real, pure, native code. It has no virtual machine running or anything like that. So in that sense, it's more native than Java is. Interesting. <laughs> and it, it's like a, it's a compiler flag. So you flip a switch and you decide if it's either compiled or not. Of course, on the other side, you need to have, uh, if it's not compiled, you have the, an interpreter, which is what the, the debug version of your app becomes. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. And it seems like this is, you know, the more I'm, you're talking about this, the more we're learning. And the deeper we get into Dart, it, it really, to me, makes me feel like this is such an underutilized language and there's so many possibilities for it. And I, I wonder why I haven't heard more about it. 100%. I was basically going to point the same thing to Don. Like, I feel this. So, well, why haven't we heard it? Because right? you haven't been listening. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> we need to get better marketing people. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think we have been listening, but there's just not been the right amount of content or the right content pushed out there. Because these That's things, true. like, we didn't know. Like, yeah, I mean, like, I don't, I don't I know. know if it's hot reload. I don't know. I didn't know this could be compiled down to ARM and, and all of these possible benefits. I didn't know that I could write the same widget and it would compile easily to both. I mean, maybe that just me not diving too much into Dart, and that's probably what it is. But at the same time, I don't feel like it's been pushed as much as like, hey, look at something new that, that's coming out in Kotlin or something new for Android Studio. Um, I just feel like uh, Flutter just hasn't been pushed that much with Dart. And, and hopefully maybe that changes because it sounds like it's very powerful. Yeah, no, it is. And it- I mean, you kind of said it yourself. Uh, There's a few keywords that uh, immediately make people um, disgusted about the entire idea. Uh, So the keywords are, I think, uh, Google. So you immediately imagine, oh, this is just an experiment. It's going to be abandoned in, I don't know, a few months. (laughs) It's beta. Uh, Dart. Yeah, beta before it was alpha, so even worse. Uh, Dart. (laughs) If you say Dart, people are like, ah, come on, seriously. Uh, what else? Yeah, cross-platform. <laughs> if you say cross-platform, you know, people just laugh at your face. So if you market it like that, of course, no one is interested. But this is this is really different. Like, the, again, the fact that it's cross-platform is just a side effect. It's not interesting because of that. It's super nice that it works that way. But that's not the main point to me, honestly. That makes sense. And I guess a large part of it was also, it seemed like when Dart came out, it was... It, it sort of came into this world with a whimper, right? Mm-hmm. It didn't exactly come out strong like Kotlin or one of the other languages where they were like, yeah. it almost seemed like Google was like, oh, this is like a thing that one of our engineers tried in their 20% time and it's like kind of okay. I'm, obviously, I'm I'm underplaying this and that's unfair. No, but, no, but it's true. Like they did been using it internally, but um, externally, very few people have actually adopted it. Um, and they... Let's say they were not so public lately because they uh, underwent a huge refactoring of their whole uh, tool chain and ecosystem to make it so um, Dart is now one common front end. So all the tools share uh, the relevant code. And essentially that, that means that instead of having three different implementations of Dart, you have one with different like backends for, for everything you do. Uh, and so every time you now want to change something, it's actually not just possible, but much easier than it ever was before. 
Hey folks, Kaushik here. I just wanted to step in and say, because we were having so much fun talking about Flutter and Dart, this episode extended a little bit longer than what we would fit typically in a single episode. So we have actually broken it into two parts. If you liked what you've been hearing so far, you definitely want to listen to the next one. In the next one, we dive into Dart 2 specifically, how one would do testing in Flutter, uh, the React componentized style of thinking that we use when building a Flutter app, and so much more, a whole bunch of those details. So stay tuned for the next episode, and we'll cover a whole bunch of those topics. See you in the next episode. Once again, this episode of Fragmented is brought to you by Microsoft's App Center. App Center allows you to get going quickly with your continuous integration, continuous delivery, and build pipeline. Spend less time configuring, managing servers, and worrying about all that mumbo jumbo, and spend more time writing code and solving business problems. Check it out at appcenter.ms. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.